All right, we're at segment three, and I think in this one... Okay. Uh, we started with... Uh, okay, Lord Mateus last time, so we're starting with Kevin. And this is going to be on characters and monsters, starting with characters. Since you specifically said that you generally... Uh, create the characters beforehand. How do you design player characters that fit well within your particular horror one shot? Well, I know what they're going up against. I know some of the skills and things that they need. So I try to divvy it out between the various player characters to give them enough where if they work as a team and pull the resources, you know, they should have a good shot at success of finding and destroying or stopping uh, the big bad, whatever it is. And then I try to make the characters, you know, interesting. Uh, give them a little bit of a backstory. It's funny what you can instill in just three or four sentences uh, if you write it right. Um, you know, your, your character is ambitious and whatever and is always looking for an opportunity. However, you know, at the same time, he's he's loyal and fearless. Or he's you know, cowardly, but, you know, and you can put in all kinds of little things. You can, if you want, you can have characters be related to each other. I rarely do that. Um, I, 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 the most common factor that I ever put into some of my stuff is that they've experienced some similar things, or maybe they belong to the same organization and, you know, maybe they know each other, maybe they don't, but I don't have them being spouses or friends or generally, um, I just give them a lot of the same motivation. You're motivated to find and stop whatever this horrible thing is. Uh, and, and then, like I said, I give them enough to work with to be interesting and to actually have a fighting chance uh, against this thing. And it's funny, sometimes that works really well where, where people play the character exactly as you envisioned them and you're like, yay! <laughs> and then other times... They just play him horribly, and there's some like really vital thing that you deliberately gave that character that they completely <laughs> ignore, but somehow they still pull it off. So, you know, again, that's the beauty of role playing. If the people are, are playing clever and thinking about what they're doing, they, they can accomplish the goal, and especially if they're working together or mm -hmm. if they're just lucky. How do you handle character death in a horror one shot? Um, you know, people die, especially in horror games. Um, you know, I think players should be pretty uh, prepared for that. Um, if they're not, what I like to do is when they, they die, when a, if, when a character dies, I say, oh, man, that was so unfortunate. You didn't really have a chance because of this or that. But, man, when you accomplished this or you, when you found that clue, it helped the whole group it kind of takes off the sting of, of dying, but dude, you're going to die. I, I had one game where the group was playing great, and then suddenly uh, this guy, who's a really good game master himself, did something. Basically, he set a bomb right up against the gas pipe, <laughs> and, and he says, I light it. And, cool. and the whole rest of the group is like, wait, did you tell any of us what we're going to do? What you're going to do? And he's like, uh, well, yeah, I imagine I would have radioed you guys and told you. And I'm like, but you did. <laughs> <All right. laughs> yep. and, 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 you know, why you decided you had to kill yourself. He's like, kill myself. I wouldn't kill my, my character wouldn't kill himself. I'm like, you're right there. You're in the basement. There's no way you can get away. You just lit it. Kaboom. And, you know, the group was, was not happy, by the way, because uh, they were playing great. And I, I tried not to kill them all, but the two people who were closest to the blast and the guy who lit the bomb, they're just gore splattered across the ruins of this house. Uh, <laughs> and, and the rest of them I put into traction and in the hospital, but they, they lived and they knew they fought the, the big bad guy and, and won and, and the monsters and destroyed them. But, you know, it was a very bittersweet, and it was a one shot and they're like, yeah, I guess. All right. And it's like, <laughs> I can't help it. That's what this idiot did. <laughs> you know, what's really funny about that is a lot of people will say things like, well, my character would never have done that. Uh, talk to any police officer, highway patrol, whatever, how many people, when they get nervous, 
accidentally step on the gas instead of the brake. And to be, I'd never do that. It happens to so many people. So the fact that, yeah, you didn't tell somebody, it could have been in your head that you did. It could have been that you weren't even thinking about telling somebody else because your character was under stress. Whatever it happened to be, but you didn't tell them. Just so happens That's exactly what I said because the guy's like, he, he said exactly that. He's like, I would, my character would never do that. And I'm like, but he did. And I said, clearly the stress and the heat of the moment, you weren't thinking clearly. And it's like, I got to destroy these things. And you lit it. And then you're like, oh, crap. <laughs> but it's too late. I mean, it happens. It's, it's always nicer when someone dies heroically. Uh, or, or if you're playing, you know, a splatter movie, you know, the character, I, I would assume, Lord Matthias, that you set him up and say, look, people are going to die in this game. And, uh, you know, try to go out in an interesting way. Uh, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Know, yeah. It, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, I, I sort of feel like that's the fun of, of a game like that, too. Like, if, like, I, I presume people are playing a horror one shot or and bought the ticket for the ride, like going to horror movies. So they like, they want, part of them wants to be the victim, if that makes any sense. And so I kind of lean into that. So. Okay. Baron. How do you design player characters that fit well within a Halloween horror one shot? Typically, I'll let them, I, I will give them the background and let them build the characters. Okay. Good, bad, and different. But the thing is, is typically when they are creating the characters, they always forget something. Especially because they're wanting to get into the game. They always forget something. It, it never fails. And, you know, sometimes as a GM, you've got to throw in maybe something you weren't planning, throw in that MacGuffin that's going to, to kill the big bad. You know, that 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 is something that, you know, you have to take what, into consideration. What's an consideration. example of something that they would forget, that, you, that you've seen somebody forget? Well, for instance, I, I've actually seen a player forget to buy armor in a fantasy game and they're walking around there in their tunic and they're in their, in their, in their pants and the boots. And, and I mean, they got their, their, their awesome sword and everything else. And I'm like, okay, so what's your AC? And they're like, oh. you, know, you, you see the look on their face and you're just like, because they forgot, you know, and sometimes you do have to give them, you know, that MacGuffin of, Oh, well, you know, they come across the first band. I keep using zombies and everything, but you know, why not? It's, it's why it's I'm so bored of the zombie trope. Everybody uses them. Everyone's like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> as, as they as they come across a, a pack of demonic kobolds. There, there we go. go. There, there, there we go. <laughs> and so he's he's strapping the what's left of their leather armor all over his body to, to give him some armor, you know, or you know, something like that, and you know. You know, or, you know, sometimes they forget to buy weapons. They forget to buy rations. They forget to buy... Or they know. forget a skill that they need. I had characters who, like, had a, had a car and all this gear, and they jump in the car, and I'm like, so what's your piloting skill for, for <laughs> automobile? And they're like, uh... I don't... I, don't, I can't drive. <laughs> you know, it's like... Move over and let one of the other players who can, or oh, you're in a world of hurt, man, because you're trying to make a sharp turn. And uh, exactly, yeah, I'll exactly. So, the parking lot going the speed limit, no problem. But as soon as you got to get away from that zombie horde, well, guess what? <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> so I mean, I mean, the, but you know, and typically, I I will use you know sometimes pit those weaknesses in also because it actually makes for better storytelling because you know it you know everyone thinks okay i'm gonna make this un unbeatable badass i'm gonna whoop everything but oh i got this kryptonite i forgot this uh oh you know and, and sometimes seeing that uh oh face and then the rest of them all look at that person and be like how did you forget that <laughs> you know, i don't know you know or they look at themselves and go, uh oh, what did I forget? Exactly, exactly. Then they're all like pulling their sheets out looking and and everything else. And I said, 
if you find anything you miss, it, there's no time. Because how, we're already rolling. So how do you encourage your players to role play or naturally... I don't know how to say it. I don't. Want, I don't want to make this sound forced. I just be immersed. I guess that's the word. Uh, in the fear, the panic, and the stress of a horror situation. Well, I mean, like I said, I tend to lean more towards psychological because uh, I, I've actually had you know someone who you know it was a a modern game, and they were they were driving, and then all of a sudden they they drove into an area and all the electronics just die. So watch. Actually is, had that happen in the Sandia mountains in real life. It was freaky yeah, as hell. Yeah. A, a car goes off. GPS trackers go off. You know, luckily one person was, was playing kind of the boy scout type character. So he actually had a map of the area in, in an actual, you know, compass. And he had the skills to be able to navigate through so they weren't completely lost and because they could only take the road so far and then they had to go on foot. Uh, so, you know, some things like that, just, you know, throwing something at them that they aren't expecting, you know, whether it's a, a supernatural, a, a physical barrier is a great one. Also, you know, they're driving through a pass and, you know, a mile in front of them, they see a rock crashing down the hill and it lands in the middle of the road while well, there's no way to pass it. Everybody's so favorite now, fallen tree. The, the fallen tree, you know, you know, you, th there are so many things that you can do to help actually, you know, guide them and actually give them, you know, not necessarily the big bad type obstacles, but use the environment along with it because the environment will actually help them get into the mind space of, okay, I'm in this area. You know, everyone can, can think of, you know, I, I, and you know, I'm in the woods, you know, I'm going through, through this Canyon. Everyone's seen that, at least seen that Western where, you know, the, we're going to lead them into devil's pass and then we're going to ambush them, you know, <laughs> that type of thing. And, you know, everyone can visualize that, which helps bring the immersion more in. Okay. All right. Let's uh, bounce on up there to Lord Mattias. How do you design player characters that fit well within a Halloween horror one shot? Because you said that you pre-gen them also, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, I know I talked about vulnerabilities, but I also make sure that they're capable of figuring out what's going on. Because, again, I think a good uh, horror movie, you know, the protagonist ends up figuring something out, usually outside the box, um, you know, uh, where they can survive or defeat whatever it is that they got to defeat. But, um, you know, the characters will be standard for the, the game that I'm running. So, mm -hmm. like, if I'm going to run Alien RPG, more than likely you're going to be, uh, you know, a crew on a ship. So you're going to have the engineer, you're going to have, you know, the pilot, you're going to have the captain, this, that, and the other thing. If it's called a Cthulhu thing, that's a little bit more open because uh, I get a little bit more creative with that. But, I mean, if there's going to be investigators, then they're going to be investigators. But they're not going to be super powered tough guys. You know, I want them to feel, maybe even look physically. You know, the player looks at their character sheet and they're like, I have six hit points. You know, like, okay, yeah, you got six hit points. So that that immediately, that going back to that psychology thing, it sets the tone. They're like, okay, my character can get aced pretty quickly. So um, uh, they, they're they going to be able to figure things out, but whether or not they're going to use what they would typically use to defeat a bad guy in a standard fantasy game or sci-fi game, uh, that's up in the air. Because, like I said, I prefer to twist things on their head and and you know the strong guy isn't going to be able to strong his way out of it the smart guy's not going to be able to smart his way out of it so you know you you mentioned alien and while i think great game masters you know probably you three kevin's talked a lot about uh, you know it's game master experience can use any system to to really embrace the spirit of, of a good one shot but in terms of mechanics the cinematic mode of alien is just absolutely fan freaking 
fantastic as far as building up. Like if you want to do your own event horizon, which is one of my favorite movies of all time uh, in terms of the, the horror suspense genre like that or alien or whatever in that cinematic mode one shot again you're inexperienced or you want something more mechanical pop 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 alien just has it right there absolutely i love its cinematic mode uh for that i think it does a great job um can you share an example of a memorable character character specifically that enhance the horror experience for the group Oh, let's see. Um, oh, okay. So going back to that uh, Call of Cthulhu game where the players were members of a uh, television show, a reality TV ghost hunter show. Um, one of the characters was a psychic, but he was a fraud. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and one player suspected and hated him. So like I, I had like these relationships things so, because I wanted to have those moments where, you know, that's well someone's about to get eaten and the player's like, yeah, I don't like you, go get eaten, you know. Um, but anyway, so I, my buddy uh, who was playing the fraud man, uh, they would be talking about what to do, uh, even like ah, maybe we should set a camera down this hall, and all of a sudden he just sit there, lean back in his chair, close his eyes, put his hand up. And he goes, you should, the spirits tell me you should put it in the right corner. And like, everyone was like, whoa. He's, and he just start rolling dice. He was, just, cause he's also a game master. So he knew <laughs> the power of the dice roll. Right. Uh -huh. so, he'd, yep. so he'd start doing that. And everyone's like, is this guy psychic? Like, I'm like, as far as you know, you know, uh, he totally hammed it up. It was <laughs> awesome. It was awesome. And it was pretty cool when he got eaten too. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you get for being psychic. <laughs> get eaten. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, he totally leaned into it, and it was like like those goofy. I really got that goofy ghost hunter thing going that game that Halloween. Um, and I was very very happy about that. Um, one of my more memorable Halloween shots amongst my friends, actually. Okay, so in terms of player characters. Uh, anything else you guys want to address uh, as far as that goes? Or are we ready to jump into monsters? Let's talk about <laughs> monsters. All right. Um, and Kevin, I'm not trying to put you on the spot for this one, but I, it's because I'm truly ignorant and interested. If Box Nightmares has anything that can that can add to the monster side of it, I'm all ears because I'm debating putting that on my Christmas. <laughs> I'm like, hmm, do I want that on my on my Christmas uh, uh, package list this year? But uh, all right, let me read some super chats and then we'll get into the next one. Um, <laughs> Kevin's greatest villains are the player characters. He has masterminded the ability to get certain players to do the wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That was good. <laughs> Uh, oh, say so. Thank you for the trooper. That was that uh, Cosmonaut uh, th Cosmere. There we go, Cosmere Nut. Uh, thank you very much. Hey, Kevin, is it possible to use the demigod RCC as a template to add other mortal races such as a dragon hatchling? Just curious. I, I mean, sure. I mean, you can use a lot of that stuff as a template for for creating anything you really think fits. So, sure, go for it. There we go. All right. We are moving down to who do we start with this time? Looks like I started with Kevin last time. Yep. So I should be starting with Baron this one. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, yep, six. All right. Baron, how do you create monsters or antagonists that inspire fear rather than just being combat challenges? I have not done this yet, but I'm currently reading a book series called The Deathless Series. And it is a very horror-esque type book series where the end of the world comes and there's zombies and werewolves. And I'm going to use this in my next one because the more that the zombies feed, the more intelligent they become. Oh, wow. So to the point of they will also get some type of powers along with this as being deathless if they've eaten enough so doing things along those lines will you know 
make them a combat challenge. I mean, you can start off the your your little horror with you know they're they're killing just regular slow zombies, and then as they keep going, now they're getting into zombies that can run at them. It's like, whoa, wait a second! And then all of a sudden, they've got zombies who are who are flinging magic at them, or you know psychic esque abilities. And, you know, that are able to, to disappear into shadows who are, you know, able to, you know, invade their minds, you know, things along these lines. So, so they're know, level up zombies <laughs> pretty much. And, and the thing is, is that if, if you're in, it was like reading, you know, with this book, because I, I listen to audio books uh, with, with the way that the, the books are, you know, and even, you know, the werewolves go that way also it is because the more that they devour the stronger they get and you know the, it's a very interesting twist on your typical werewolf or zombie side mm-hmm. uh and and then you also have where they can become corrupted if the werewolves start munching on the zombies they get all corrupted and and get crazy and mad cow disease them. or mad zombie disease Pretty much, and because because it's all spent, spent stemmed from a virus, basically, uh, and using that type of of mechanic, I think, with a especially with zombies, number one, it gives you monsters that are kind of the same, but they evolve. So the the characters don't know the next set of zombies or the next set that they're going to come across of what they're going to find. So it's like you know it, it's like it's like evolving that those monsters as they go, and it's truthfully you know and that that feeds into that fear of the well I know but the fear of I don't know. Mm-hmm. So therefore, therefore, it, it 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 ratchets it up to that tension, and then you know they find out what they can do. You know, once they get to like the third horde on like the third, fourth, fifth day, and then all of a sudden, you know, they're the zombies are 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 moving like you know the Flash, or they're in they're just disappearing and then reappearing, attacking and then disappearing again. I feel like Kevin should be holding up the Dead Rain book again because I think you've described every zombie in his book. In this case. <laughs> <laughs> like yep read about that in dead rain yep read about that in dead rain yep dead rain. <laughs> well and, and the other thing is it's just kind of a, an offshoot is that they can also with the devouring of brains they can also get memories and abilities from them too so well, well, i think it's funny i don't know what stuck <laughs> 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 what, what I find funny though is I can just imagine at the end of the session. All right, yeah, I I, I killed four monsters and I uh, you know we saved the princess and we did this great. Uh, it's a thousand XP. Yeah, I, I I leapt off the car. I swung on the chandelier. I jumped on this guy. It was really cool. Okay, there's a thousand XP. I got seven brains. Great, got seven brains. Move, <laughs> just level up from seven brains. I, I, there's just something weird about that that made me laugh. You know, ah, I want to play that character now. <laughs> uh, actually, you answered the follow-up I was going to give you, so screw you. I'm moving on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Reading nice. into my questions, I don't even send them the follow-up questions, or sometimes I make them up on my own. But you know, whatever. Uh, Lord M- Matthias, how do you create monsters or antagonists that inspire fear rather than just being combat challenges? Um, I don't start with stat blocks. I come up with a cool idea and then I just sort of build around that. I don't worry about the stat blocks. I don't I don't unless I'm doing like a creature feature, which is rare, because creature features is kind of like what you get. Another with book like, Kevin's gonna hold up. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, He's go <laughs> there it is. Creature feature. There you go. <laughs> Product placement. Yeah. Uh you typically do the <laughs> creature feature stuff with like your standard game so when i'm doing horror i want something different i want something cool i want something that's gonna like inspire fear so i'll get like uh a uh, inspired by like maybe a song i listen to Mm -hmm. or maybe another movie i watched or, or just something i'm thinking about while driving down some 
back road, country road, you know, my, from my hometown, you know, and uh, I'll start there and I'll I'll try to make sure I have a cool history and reason for the, for the bad, big bad to be there. And then as part of that, like onion, uh, I'll mm-hmm. be dropping hints, not just about like the situation that the players find themselves in, but what it is that they're about to face or they will be facing or they could face. I think, Kevin, you mentioned something earlier where uh, the villain shows up early, but but then gets away. So like they see a flash of it, right? And then that's so why it starts to build in their mind. I think the more you let the players do the imagining for you, the better your villain's going to be. Um, in my Call of Cthulhu one shots I was doing, I had like this ancient, well, he wasn't ancient, but he was from the uh, 1600s, found like a Cthulhu artifact, became immortal and was possessing the bodies of his children. That's how he stayed immortal. Uh, named Nathaniel Thornton, Captain Nathaniel Thornton. And uh, he was somehow referenced in every single one shot. So the point where he, he was kind of like my Jason Voorhees, my Freddy Krueger. And every time the players saw Thornton, the, the word or they heard it they're like oh my god they never faced him they never faced him i never had to stat him out he was just there uh but they knew he was bad so uh, i think keep the mystery and feed it feed feed the uh villains backstory and, and abilities slowly so the players start to you know freak out about it let it build in their mind that's what i do Okay, well, you answered yours as well, so I get to move on. This is funny because he's like, I'm like, okay, I can ask him this one. Oh, he just answered it. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I don't have anything on my own because I thought you gave a really great answer. So uh, we're going to drop down uh, to Kevin. And same question for you. How do you create monsters or antagonists that inspire fear rather than just being combat challenges? Yeah, I, I agree. Everything both Baron and... No, they're spot on, right? (laughs) Lord Mateus have... Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to add, you know, steal steal great ideas wherever they show up from. Whether it's a movie, like like you said, you know, gee, I'm walking down a sort of a scary street. You know, remember those things. When you have, like, sort of a scary experience, think, oh, how can I put that in my game? Uh, Whether it's your campaign or whether it's a one-shot... Um, you know, think of things that scared you in, in your favorite horror movies, whether it's Alien or Nightmare on Elm Street or whatever it is, you know, think about those things and try to recapture them. I, I agree about the mystery thing. Um, and, uh, you know, not every creature has to be some big slobbering alien. Uh, so I, I don't know if you have the book yet, and this isn't a plug, but you mentioned you know, creatures, creature feature has a ton of great creatures. If you don't have this, I would recommend this even more than Box Nightmares. Box Nightmares is a little bit more of a adventure book. And this has adventures in it as well. But it's got a bunch of really cool different creatures, like 15 different supernatural I can creatures. promise you that one is on my list for this year because I think it's the only monster manual that you have that I don't own. And one of the creatures in that is called the Gorma Glut. And it's it's little. I mean, it's like that that big. It's like the size of a lunchbox, and it's it's hideous and terrible. And, and and when you get into a fight with it, it's easy to fight it and kill it. But you've got to find it first. And because it's so little, it typically lives between the walls, um, and in in the basement and an attic and all over the place. That's hard to get. And the thing is. It radiates this corrupting kind of dark energy that brings out the worst in everybody around it. Oh, wow. So, like, there's an adventure in here where, in, in an apartment building, where things are just really building and building and building to this fever point where people are acting weird and are, are becoming aggressive or paranoid and all this stuff. And you have to figure out, A, what it is. And when you figure out what it is, you got to figure out how do I find it and, and, and kill it. And the problem is the things it's manipulating may, may try to stop you from doing that. Uh, and so you're actually fighting people 
that you know are being influenced by a dark force. So do you want to hurt them badly or kill them? I mean, they're under the influence of something more powerful and supernatural. And, and that's challenging, too. So I like to have villains, even when it's a powerful supernatural creature, I like to have villains that are, are like insidious mm -hmm. and, and cruel and, and just despicable because it just, to me, that that's what sort of the demonic and, and evil is. And you want to get that across and, and how to bring out the sense of fear is I like to have in both of you guys have mentioned it at various points today is examples of what it's capable of doing. So you might find some horribly mutilated body or someone's gone missing, but there's like blood everywhere. And it's like show oh, don't God. tell, right? Exactly. Exactly. And, and it, it just builds it up. The more you can show, the more you can do. Uh, I like to give people rumors about stuff. Uh, and the cool thing about rumors is maybe it's true. Maybe it's an exaggeration. Maybe it's complete baloney. You have to kind of figure that out. But but even if it's complete baloney, it can scare, you know, the pants off somebody. Because mm -hmm. it's like, oh, my gosh, is it that? I don't want to go up against that. How do we fight something like that? And it's not that. But you scared them into thinking it could be because evidence suggests maybe it is. Um, and then I just like to have, like I said, I, I like to have villains that are, uh, you know, not, I'm going to take over the world or destroy the world. I like to have villains that are just, like I said, despicable. I like to hurt people, <laughs> you know, kind of villains. And it's like, yikes, or why are you doing this? Because you're just worms. You're nothing to me. You're humans. You know, and so I do it. Um, and you should bow down and beg me not to do this to you kind of thing. I, I love that kind of thing as opposed to slobbery monster, I'm here to eat you. I mean, those are cool too. And there's a place for those. And, and I, I, I love those as well. But when I have a big baddie or a little baddie in the case of a gorma glut, <laughs> um, I, I like to have more dimension to it and more despicableness to it because it creates that sense of fear and dread and disgust i like disgust in games if you get rid of the comedic elements of this and just really sit back and take a look the vorpal bunny from the monty python the holy grail that what it's just a rabbit and then you see what it does to somebody You're like wait what what just happened here i love effects like that Obviously, you know, that's a comedic uh, you know, movie, so it kind of loses some of that gravitas, so to speak. But <clears throat> but just that concept, like, oh, shut up. It's just a dumb little bird or some little grandma. Ooh, we got a rat in the basement. Who cares? And then, whoa, what just happened here? Everything's dimmer. Everything's darker. You're tripping over things you shouldn't be tripping over. Uh, you're... you're I like to throw in dice mechanics sometimes, too. Your, your die rolls are just a little bit worse as it's just exuding this the sense of fear and, and, and extra dimensional disgust. I, I like that. No, I think the Vorpal bunny is actually a great example because think about it in real life. You saw this little bunny and it suddenly leaps, leaps up and rips the throat out of Baron. I don't know about you, but I'd be peeing my pants and running for the hills. <laughs> I don't have to outrun the rabbit. I just got to outrun you. <laughs> exactly. 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 <laughs> All right. Anything, uh, anything else you guys want to add to monsters? I know that a lot of things can be said about monsters, but to be fair, you guys in probably the most perfect question slash segment we've ever had really hit the nail on the head in terms of, uh, of how you create these monsters as antagonists uh, in a very concise way that I think people can, uh, can understand and you help food for thought in their games. But if you've got anything you feel is left on the table, go ahead a second, read some chat and move on. Yeah. I, I, just, I, I like, Go ahead. Go ahead. I just wanted actually. You mentioned Kevin uh, the word insidious uh, in the context of this creature that can corrupt others. I think that's actually a really cool thing uh, to think about as well because sometimes the horror that the, uh, a character experiences is not just like 
something that happens to their body or some weird thing that happens. It's it's the fact that they're forced to do something that they don't want to do or they mm. they know they can't do or and there's no escape um, and something insidious like that. I love that word insidious that forces a player character to attack like Bob the farmer because he's possessed. You know, they like Bob. Bob's been good to them, you know, but now Bob's coming at him with a pitchfork while foaming at the mouth. You know what I mean? I think that's 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 a really good point to bring up. Like sometimes that is horrific. And there's no yep. there's no blood involved, you know, no tentacles or anything. It's just it's just Bob. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I also want to mention that uh tragic monsters can be cool. <laughs> yes. Uh, a couple of great examples of those of course is the classic is Frankenstein monster. Mm -hmm. And the other one that, that I personally love, I love the design of the creature. I, it, it's a hack and slash movie that suddenly becomes not a hack and slash movie uh, or a splatter movie is Pumpkinhead. Mm. If you guys haven't seen it, you need to see it. Pumpkinhead oh. is great. The monster is Stan Winston, one of his best designs ever. And uh, the, the Pumpkinhead is a creature of vengeance. And, and what you discover as you watch the movie, not, not to, to spoil everything, but the guy who is seeking vengeance by calling up Pumpkinhead uh, starts to take on the appearance of Pumpkinhead. And he realizes what he's doing is, is terrible. And even though his vengeance was kind of justified, uh, it, he realizes it's wrong and, and he can't stop it. And it's just, it's just beautiful. It's, it's a great movie because it, it's one of, you, you know, Lord Mateus keeps mentioning twists. It, it looks like your typical teenage splatter movie. You know, these teenagers done did something bad and now they're going to pay. And one by one, they're getting killed in, in, in usually in terrible ways. <laughs> and, and, and suddenly it has this moral twist to it where the guy who summoned it up doesn't want it to be doing these things and how can he stop it? Uh, and it's, 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 it's a really good, I mean, it's a grade B horror movie, like a lot of horror movies, but it's a really great one. <laughs> I highly recommend it. By the way, that concept right there is the way every Dungeons and Dragons fifth edition warlock should be played too. Um, all right. Uh, we'll read some questions here. I just realized something. I don't know how I went this far into this uh, show. We're talking about horror. We're talking about you know, Halloween, and we're talking about getting Earth Dawn. Everybody drink. That's right. The drinking game. I mentioned Earth. Earth Dawn has absolutely every adventure can be. You don't, you don't want every adventure based on horrors, but horrors. You can get so many great ideas from them. For people who don't know what they are, the quick versions is think of them as demons. That's the best way to explain it, but they do so much more than that. They're in your head. They take over society. They turn your best friend and twist him into something that he's not. Uh, and I just love the way the game integrates horrors into it. Now, we're going to talk about games way at the end, right right at the very end. We're going to talk to some good games out here. Kevin's got like 12 of them that he's written. I know Lord, Lord, Lord Mattias has got to oh, got a drink. For Saint Earth, uh, by the way, uh, for those who don't know, Earth Dawn is a drinking game here because I talk about it all the time. At least I used to. Um, but uh, we're, we're going to talk about some games out there that are good for this. So we'll, we'll uh, bring those up at the end. But yeah, I, I can't believe I didn't mention it because everything that these guys have been talking about, especially as far as the monsters go here, is how the horrors from the weakest to the most powerful is generally how they work behind the scenes, creepily. Sure, they can be in your face as well. But if you see one, it's pretty much over for you at that point. It's, it's all the manipulate, the machinations, so to speak. All right, where are we? And minions. Oh, yeah. Yep. Minions. Minions yep. all the way. For them, it's horror constructs, but absolutely, yeah. And Kevin talked about that earlier with the minions, where they got to fight through the minions, you know, uh, on the timer. Um, oh, I already read that one. Uh, Beat Magnet says, uh, to make a great horror monster, you have to custom make them so that they're unknown. The fear of the unknown will make the player fill in the details that scare them. And I think that's what these guys have been saying from beginning to end, and I could not agree more. Uh, Sheriff, by the way, Sheriff was, he was in one of my old TMNT games. He was the first deer to get shot. He got hunted. 
when I was teaching him how deadly the uh, uh, the uh, modern compendium book is. That's why I love that book. Anyway, <laughs> when creating a horror scenario uh, one-off, where do you start? The goal? The main villain? So real quickly, if you guys want to jump in on this one, I'm asking this question even though it's not a Super Chat because he is a member. So uh, where, where do you guys start in, in, in a quick answer? Uh, Sir Lord Mateus. Uh, that actually depends on what I want to run, like in terms of the type of horror scenario, and I, and honestly, what kind of inspires me. Like I get inspired by random stuff, a song, uh, a, a conversation I had. You know what I mean? Um, so sure. it really depends a lot. Uh, if if starting off with the villain seems to make sense, then go for it. Uh, starting off with like the mystery or the scene or the scenario or the town or with the location, go for it. I just see that's me. I I envision a scenario and then I just kind of expand from that until it becomes its own animal. Yeah, as long as you got that onion, like in my opinion, so you just like the players have something to peel back and get to the heart of whatever's going on. So you might be starting in the middle section of the onion and work your way, you know. But sure, it all depends. I don't know. All this all this talk about onions makes me want to go to Outback and get a blooming onion. <laughs> Never cry. I, it's either either blooming onion or or I'm waiting to cry. I don't know which one. The horror. Uh, <laughs> the horror. Uh, yeah, I, I did out to to Lord Mateus. I, I uh, it's wherever the idea kind of strikes. Sometimes for me, it's the monster. Sometimes it's the scenario or the location. Other times, it's it's the goal. Um, it can be any of those, whatever kind of motivates you, inspires you to create the adventure in the first place. Okay. Now, for and me, there. what what I would suggest is not necessarily don't worry about about the mechanics, about anything else. What is it the 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 story you want to tell? You start start there. Start with your story. What kind of story do you want to tell? And then the rest of it will just drop in as you, and once you get that part figured out, you know, you know, it, you can be, you know, they, you know, I want to tell a story about vampires. I want to tell a story about, you know, uh, halflings that, that, that eat flesh. They're not dead, but they eat flesh. At least three, four times a day. You've been playing too um, much Forbidden Land, sir. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, no, it, but no it, it's something along those lines. What what is the narrative of your story that you're wanting to, to give? And then you can figure out the rest of the pieces to put in. Uh, I think that is, I I, I, I want to say a lot of game masters try to overthink it, but. You know, it, I, I'm going to use the and Kevin probably knows this this term very very well because he's been writing for years. The kiss method, which is keep it simple, stupid, and that's literally what you have to do. You know, where where what's the arc that you want to tell? What what story do you want to tell your players? And then you can figure out the rest of it. That that's literally you just keep it as simple as you can. Okay. Well, and, and, and be intuitive. It, it's all about character and story. So, so, um, what what you're saying is 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 very true, Baron. And uh, a great example is uh, we have a guy who's a super talented writer. Right? I can't disclose what the project is, but it's something new and something cool, uh, and hopefully something will come out end of next year. But um, he's got this great world. Uh, he's got all this background. He has a basic idea for, for the bad guys and the villains and whatnot. And, you know, we're looking, Sean and I are looking at all this and we're like, but what do the players do? Why do I want to play in this world? What, and, and it's all cool stuff. And it's like, but why do I want to play this? And I want to play this because what cool character I have doing what cool things with what cool shit. So always keep your, your, your players in mind and what's going to be ultimately fun for them. 
whether they, they die in the campaign <laughs> because it's a horror game or whether they're going to defeat some big hideous monster, what's going to make it fun for the players? You should always keep your players in mind. And, and role play yourself in that. And Sean and I were just talking about this earlier today. How people don't role play. Role playing. I mean, when I'm coming up with something, whether it's a one-shot adventure or a campaign or a source book, I'm always thinking, if I was the player, what am I getting out of this? Well, you know, it, and in fact, it, it'll sound stupid, but there's a lot of times where I'm pounding away on the keyboard and I'm like, oh man, the players are going to love this. And I'm getting all excited because I can envision if it was me and I'm running up against this thing uh, or the situation, oh boy, I'm going to be having so much fun or I'm going to be so scared or I'm going to be so excited. Um, and, and that's great. You know, think about what your players uh, are doing. And if you're playing with a regular group, there's nothing wrong with um, writing to your players. You know what they like, you know what they fear, you know what they have little phobias about. Play on that. You know, you got someone who's scared of spiders put in a spider creature or suggest it's going to be a spider creature. But wait, wait, stop. Time up, X card. I was just gonna say. I was just gonna say X card. X card. <laughs> well, it, it's it's funny you say that, Kevin, because a story that I've told oftentimes here is the story of the giant ant. The first time I ever played Dungeons and Dragons, I was ten years old, and I remember the game master having us go through a, a, a cave system that that had giant ants. You know, these two foot long ants in there. Now, anybody who knows anything about me knows I turn into a five year old girl when it comes to insects. I don't know why. Just like ah. You know, like I don't, so I'm 10 years old, right? And we're fighting these bugs, and my brains go two foot ants. No, when I biked home that night, which was a block down and a block over, the, it was dark outside. I'm riding my bike, going just pretending like I could hear chitter, 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 chitter. Like, no, no. So I love the idea of getting in that imagination going and getting into it. And when I'm reading the books, especially the Palladium books, I'm not saying this to pander. I really mean this. Uh, you you can, you can visualize the world. You can visualize the characters. You can visualize what is going on. Absolutely. All right. Uh, yeah. Share, share. Leave me alone. Shares. Leave me alone. <laughs> he, he's in the air force with me. So, all right, let's, um, we got one more segment to go. Kevin, do you have time for one more segment? Sure. Well, oh, I think we right. answered a lot of it. It probably did. That is true. That's that's the way this, honestly, the way it goes. I do like to tailor these things. So we have a beginning, you know, setting the stage. Then we have, you know, players. Then we have the game. Now we're getting toward the end of it is the art of fear. Because what is all of this supposed to be about? It's about fear. These might be quick answers, but uh, let's, uh, oops, I got to read some super chat. Was there any super chats? I thought I read the chat. I did read the chat. So uh, before. Boom, do that. Boom, do that. All right. Just as a reminder, some Rando RPG live stream airs live on Fridays at 6 p.m. Central Time, except for the last Friday of the month. That's right. Next week, we will not have one of these because we're going to have the members only. Once this live stream ends, the full live stream will be available for YouTube members only, while these four discussion segments will post to the public a month later. So if you want to chat with the panelists, Come watch us live. Else, they'll be on video later, just without all the fun chat that you're missing out on. If you enjoy this discussion, please like this video, subscribe to all of the panelist channels, which you can find in the description. And one of the links I have in there is to the Palladium store right now, which you can get the Christmas, the 2024 Christmas surprise package for 60 bucks plus shipping. You get a hundred plus dollars worth of books and other goodies. You don't want to miss it out. Whether you're a Palladium fan, you want more Palladium stuff, or you just love the lore and you use it for whatever other other system you're playing in you really do this is the best opportunity to get something at platinum's already low price but at even a more ridiculously low price fill out 10 or more items and guess what hopefully you get four or five of them that are on there i've always got what i've asked for on my list there you go hope to see you next time